Hi, everybody. My name is Matt Schechner. I'm the uh, curator, if you will, of the Thought Leadership Program for Creative Week. And uh, our little company, Stillwell Partners, was fortunate enough to get asked by the One Club to build what they had started a couple years ago with Creative Week. And we viewed it as an opportunity and a promise to deliver something special that warranted being called Creative Week in New York. And as such, we looked at other New York-centric industries where the creative well really flows. And one of those um, is, of course, fashion. So through a good friend of ours, Aaron Reitkoff, who's on stage, I think, tomorrow, um, we met Quinn Mai and her team. And um, we were actually meeting about something else. And it was one of those, oh, by the way, we're also doing this. And is this something that you might be interested in working with us on? And little did I know from that little innocent sidebar remark that we would end up with no less than three fabulous seminars all built around the world of fashion. So uh, we're thrilled you're here. The bar is open. Our policy at Creative Week is the bar is open all day long, not just at night, like most events. We start at 8.30. So I've uh, already taken a nap today and I had my blood changed. I'm back now. And uh, um, we hope you have a really terrific time over the course of the next hour or so. And please join us. We'll be here again tomorrow. We're at the Galapagos Art Space in Brooklyn as well. Um, we've got all kinds of great stuff. The website, the app, it's all really good. I won't give you any commercial. Without further ado, our dear friend, Quinn Mai. Thank you, Quinn. So uh, happy hour starts early today, I think, for us. Um, our, panel, our first panel of the week is about the intersection between reality, TV, fashion, and, um, and commerce. And we all know the success of Project Runway and shows like Fashion Star and 24-Hour Catwalk. And we're seeing how retailers and brands are moving into this space really quickly to try to find a way to captivate the audience um, and move them. So today we have a really amazing panel, um, actually a conversation that's going to be moderated by Stephanie George. But one of the women who sort of led this whole movement is, of course, um, Jane Chaw Cutler, who is the executive vice president of Full Picture. And, and for those who don't know, she, started, she heads the entertainment division at Full Picture and was the executive producer of Project Runway, which is really the first time that the fashion industry moved into the TV space. Since then, that Project Runway has won six Emmy Awards, five PGA nominations, the prestigious Peabody Award, um, she also has executive produced Models on the Runway, Seriously Funny Kids, um, as well as Stylista for CW Network and Modelina Fashion Week. On the flip side, we have with us also Derek Blasberg, who is a real Renaissance man. He is a New York Times best-selling author, he is an editor, and also um, most recently joined reality TV on 24-Hour Catwalk. Um, he not only writes for Harper's Bazaar, but V Magazine, V Man, Vogue, WL, New York Times, everything you can imagine, um, and has worked you know, very deeply in the fashion space for a number of years. Um, and here's some visuals for him. And then we have the wonderful Stephanie George as our moderator. Um, she is the executive vice president and CMO of Time Inc. Talk about multitasking. She manages the promotion and the positioning of time um, also oversees marketing research and insights for Time Content Studios with media networks, targeted media. So I'm so proud that she made time in her incredibly busy schedule to have this conversation with um, Derek and Jane. So let's welcome the team. Here we go. Welcome to my mates here. Come on, mates. By the way, when Matt Schechter calls, everybody listens. He's put on a great, great series of events, um, which I have participated in in the past. So when he called again, I just say, yes, Matt, whatever you want. But especially because I have two very accomplished guests with me here today. Um, and I'm thrilled to have them. They have very busy schedules. In fact, Jane is headed to the airport back to LA right after this. Derek stays in New York with me. And uh, he took off his jacket that has a big W on it. I asked him what it stood for, and he said, whatever. Exactly. How's that for a fashion guy for you, right? So let's get into it. Let's mix it up. And, and we're going to take some questions later, too. So I want you to feel very free about um, just, you know, give it this panel your, 
your deep thoughts and, and hit them with some questions when we're through. But before you do, I have some questions, right? And so this whole world that's collided together, celebrities, designers, television, consumers, mass audiences that we have to appeal to. Jane, I'm going to start with you. How complicated? It sounds complicated. And when you started Project Runway, it must have been complicated to begin with. What were some of the mountains you had to climb and the hurdles you had to leap to get a show like this to be so successful? Well, I mean, those were still pretty early days of reality television. I mean, because we're going into our 10th anniversary season this summer. So you think, you know, 10 years ago, it was still not as big a proliferation of reality TV shows as it is today. Um, so it kind of came together almost with, as with a lot of projects, a group of friends. Um, you know, uh, we had done some work for, at the time, Miramax, it says since become Weinstein Company, and they knew we had um, some good experience and relationships in the fashion and beauty world, and Harvey wanted to do a show about fashion. Initially, he wanted to do it about models because everybody kind of thought that designers were boring and that it would just be an hour of people sewing. So we kind of had to figure out, no, that's not what it would be about. It would be about the creative process and really showing the characters of these people. And so we had to kind of do a lot of um, thinking about it, a lot of writing, a lot of test cases. We spoke to Tim Gunn, uh, who was at the time fashion dean at Parsons, and we kind of asked him some practical questions. And initially, he wasn't really even supposed to be on air that much, but um, once he became the mentor, everybody, including us and the audience, fell in love with him, and he kind of became the breakout star of the show. He really did. And, um, it was a great takeoff now for so many other um, fashion types of shows that have uh, gotten lift off because of Project Runway. But Derek, you've been in the business a long time on the fashion side like me. Uh, we worked on similar brands, having spent time at W as president. Um, Derek writes for Harper's Bazaar, has done work for W, as you heard, and many other magazines. You remember the days of Elsa Clinch, right? Um. Not that old, but thank ah, you. But you uh, do remember I'm, I'm hearing about it. I'm familiar with it, yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, this all really started 20 years ago. Do you think that that kind of was the humble beginnings of all of this and putting fashion on television? Yeah, I do. And I, I think what's sort of important when we're talking about looking back at it, and in my own experience, is that not so much in the Elsa Clinch days, but in the early days of Project Runway, um, there was a real stigma attached to fashion and reality television. Um, whereas Elsa didn't have that because she was seeing in there was a, there was a level of legitimacy and intellect behind it, but you know I think ten years ago there was such a a clear delineation between between fashion and television and there was no crossover and now things have changed. I mean I think that's a really good point. Like when we were trying to get together the panel for Project Runway, I mean we really had to beg Michael Kors to do it, because we really wanted somebody who had that level of legitimacy. And also, it's hard to find somebody who's that articulate and funny um, and can judge funny. on the fly. Like, he's hilarious. So um, his right-hand person at the time, Ann Waterman, kind of was very instrumental in helping convince him. And later, she told me, you know, I told him, it's on Bravo. You know, it's a win-win, it's because if people like it, great. If they don't like it, nobody will have seen it. Because that was Bravo in its early days. Like their one hit at the time had been Queer Eye. So she was like, eh, it's no big deal. <laughs> and I've interviewed Michael since then. And what he said is that, that that came out just when he had launched Michael by Michael Kors, his first diffusion line. And we just saw, we just saw that company go public. And his take home was like $140 million. I hope he sent you something nice, Jane. I was going to say, I really wanted a friends and family you, yeah. like stock offering, but I didn't. Yeah, none of us got one. Michael's a dear friend of mine. I didn't get it either. Yeah, get it um, together, Coors. But he, get it together, Coors. But he uh, obviously is very successful. And that leads me into the next question. What does it take, okay, to appeal to mass audiences? Because fashion, really, having grown up in it, it's a group of insiders, really. And when you try to bring it to reality, okay, that, that is not an easy feat, okay, not at all. Because is reality programming, if you ask a designer, good for fashion or not? What do you both think? 
Who wants to go first? I'll take this one first then. Um, I think it's a really interesting dis discussion. I think a lot of things that sell well in high fashion don't do very well in a very commercial scale. And I think some things that sell very well commercially would never make it in a high fashion arena. Great. I mean, the obvious example, the biggest example, no pun intended, is Jessica Simpson, who, you know, she's a billion dollar empire right now. And I don't think that she has a lot of, I mean, I don't know if I should say that, like high fashion legitimacy, but I don't think she gives a, I, I don't think she, I don't think she minds, because she's taking that to the bank. I don't think she minds either, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting that you brought up Elsa Clench in the very beginning because we have tried to, I mean, that was one of my favorite shows. I, I loved it so much. And we have since tried to, you know, pitch that, I mean, even back to CNN as like a new reincarnated yeah. version of that and to many cable networks. And but why won't anyone take that? Because I, I mean, exactly, I've heard them they kicking won't. that idea around. <laughs> but I do think it would be great to have another intellectual fashion show on television, but everyone wants. Great. They like won't do it. Yeah. I'm not sure CNN is the right place for it. See, that's the reason. Okay, you pick the right place for. You have to know your audience. You pick the right place for Project Runway on mm -hmm. Lifetime. Bravo. But and, and Bravo. Now Lifetime. Now yeah. Bravo. <laughs> but CNN, there's not a big women's audience. It's still a highly. It's yeah. a male audience. It's so you have to know tolerance. where to find your audience yeah. as well. But but also the response that we get from cable executives is that that sort of fashion is too highbrow and too niche. So we always have to think, okay, what about this is accessible? You know, what makes it interesting as a story so it's not just fashion, which is just, it, it's great as an art form, but it's just the cable executives, you see their eyes glaze over and they're like, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and we have to keep it interesting and move ahead with the times. And, and what I re really respect about both of you as professionals is you take chances, okay? And those chances have worked out for both of you. So let's take the next leap. And we want to learn something here about what's, what's next, okay? Interactive reality TV programming, all right? We want to know more about that. Is that coming? Is that... In, in digital format, are you, going to be able, are you going to be able to shop right away from and see what, see what you see on Project Runway, buy it, okay? See what you see on Fashion Star, buy it, okay? World Store, Burberry, I'm on the board. The show's out. You can buy right off the runway. Where are we going? You have a good idea that that may be where we're headed more and more? Well, I mean, I think Fashion Star is an interesting experiment. I actually don't know all their sales figures. I believe, you know, I saw that they had sent out a release after their first episode. They sold out of certain things that I think at H&M um, that were kind of on the lower price point. But I think a skirt, that double zipper flyaway skirt that they tried to sell on Saks at, I think, a $350 price point didn't sell out. So I think it, it you know, it just depends. But I, it's a lot of logistics to coordinate to try to get all the retailers, the manufacturers, you know, the online people all together to have it timed for the airing of each episode. That's not an easy task. So I applaud them for having been able to even do that. That's right. That's right. We do that for certain episodes of Project Runway. Like, you know, Heidi has done some challenges for her. Uh, Heidi Klum for New Balance line and we, or Amazon, and we have it ready to go the next day. But, you know, that's one challenge out of 12 episodes, and then we do it with certain sponsors, too. The worst thing you could do, and, and Derek, I'd like for you to comment on this. I was president of InStyle for over 10 years, and I'd like to say that InStyle prompted reality television. Just a little commercial here for a moment. But, you know, we were the first ones to say where you can buy something, what colors it came in, and the price, right? And so having said that, we moved merchandise. But the worst thing you can do is you put something in the pages of the magazine, put something on air, consumer goes into the store and can't buy it. The worst well, and I thing think you that's, can do. And that's what I think is so interesting about reality television and fashion is that oftentimes the most basic functions of a designer, which are production, on-sale delivery, on-time delivery, um, are, are sometimes overlooked by entertainment. So that's an interesting parallel between, between what makes good TV and what makes a good designer. I mean, we have more flexibility in the digital world. Like, we just launched our YouTube channel uh, about almost two weeks ago 
called Look TV, and we have a lot more freedom in that to kind of do the, not just the subscribe now, but you know, we're doing something called Shop the Shows, where um, Dana Weiss says how to get the look from different TV characters on different shows, and then we offer the option to kind of go off-site to buy. I checked it out. It's very, very clever. And uh, I applaud you for doing that. I think it's going to have a lot of success, quite frankly. Um, so tell me about this. Um, Spin-offs or any sort of um, new ideas and vision that you can share. And if you can't, you can say I can't. But um, there's... That's for you, isn't it? That's all for you, but it's Project also... Runway, no, uh, we're not done with accessories, you. Accessories, all-stars. Because I would love to hear what you think could come next, okay? So both your opinions count on this one. Mine doesn't, yours does. I think spin-offs um, obviously are a testament to the success of the original. And having said that, I think as a viewer myself, I always like the original the best. Um, there are certain aspects of the spin-off that I always find fun, and it's interesting to revisit certain characters, but there's something about the freshness of a new cast and a new season um, and the flagship property that I really enjoy the most. Um, so yeah, I think spin-offs will continue, but I think what it's important to keep in mind is to keep the strength and vitality of the original property strong and to not take away too many resources from that, because I think that's really what supports everything else. Would you agree? Yes, I agree. Um, I mean, I, I wish I knew more about spinoff. My, my participation with reality TV has been something that's very new and very modern. I did a show with Alexa Chung because she was a good girlfriend of mine. I think 10 years ago, if I had been asked to do something like Project One Way, I would have been just as hesitant as Michael was. I think it's very modern now that people are seeing the benefits, both financial and commercial and public, that of, to, of, to doing, of doing a show that's on cable and stuff. Right. So if I knew what was, if I, knew, if I had a good idea for a spinoff or a good yeah. idea, I what? wouldn't tell you all. I'd take it. <laughs> oh, that's keep that, funny. Keep that, to, keep yourself. that to yourself. Take right. Jane up for a drink later. <laughs> Make, make exactly. That flight. And make a big pitch for a show, yeah, right? Exactly. Co-production. You right can here. buy her a glass of wine right over there at the <laughs> bar and then, then give her your idea. No, but I mean, the first season of Runway, we had to beg people to be guest judges. It was not easy because I was in charge of kind of basically booking all those people and it was groveling. It was, you and know, now you get trading that favors. Do it, don't you? Now you get people Now that we get lots of people who request. want to do it. But there are also still people that we want. You know, we want everybody from the first lady on down, so we're still kind of aiming high. But yeah, that first season was was not easy. And then, you know, once one person does it, then another, then obviously you get the snowball effect. And having Mike, people like Michael and Nina Garcia really helped also. Well, reality TV stars now are the new crossovers, right? So it really does, at the end of the day, help their businesses and help their careers. It helps them move into digital platforms. It helps them build global businesses, which we haven't talked about, but I'm sure every single designer that you cover in the pages of all the periodicals that you write for are all worried about their business, not just in America. It's very much a global platform, right? And that's what they're selling. So can you tell us a bit about the designers when you sit down and chat with them? What are some of the things they're telling you that this audience would be interested about the future of fashion? For me. Um, to be honest, the, the big issues, which don't really participate in, which don't really involve reality TV, the big issues I think facing a lot of designers now are timing and production. We're now looking at four to six collections a year with pre-fall resort. Um, other problems are producing them in time, not just designing them, but making them at an affordable price point. You got a lot of right. knockoffs, everything's digitalized, so all your collections are seen by the people who knock them off oftentimes before the buyers that want to buy them. Um, and of course, there's all these new markets. We've got a lot more money coming from Russia and Asia, and a right. lot less money coming from America. So, right. so there's a, there's a modern hurdles. There are game. modern hurdles. It's very well put. Well, in fact, I have one of my mentees here. I have two of them. One is from China. Where are you, Jin? Right here. There's Jin. Um, I was telling Jin on the cab ride over with a colleague of mine. I just got back from a 14-day tour throughout Asia. And uh, the comment that I made to the team was, if China gets a cold, we're all going to get the flu. Right. It's true. 
I mean, we have so many big businesses around the world, and, and business in Europe isn't that great, and in America it's sort of flat. So it is uh, an economy that we pay a lot of attention to uh, for more reason than one. We love it, we do a lot of business there, but on the other hand, there's a whole big world out there too that we have to pay attention to. So you always have to worry about your fallback position in fashion, right? Or in any business, I think. So that, that's something that we all know and have to be cognizant of. But anyway, at this point, I, I like to make this interactive. Um, I'm a former school teacher, so it's all about the students for me. Um, and we have two stars up here. And I'm sure that I'm there's questions. I'm a former questions. teacher's pet. So. <laughs> I'm sure there's questions that you want to ask um, um, my two friends up here. So don't be shy. Does anyone have any questions for our team? Yes, no? Yes, back here. Mike. Hi. Uh, hello? Um, my name's Adam, and I'm a creative director for an advertising agency. I'm a writer. I'm a, I'm a dude. I'm clearly not fashion forward, but uh, I have to give you a compliment that, you know, when the show aired 10 years ago, I guess, I can't believe it's been that long, um, I ended up seeing it and really falling in love with it, even though I think on a sheet of paper I would be the last person that would care about it, but I wanted to tell you that what I, what I fell in love with and, and what the other dude friends of mine that fell in love with that show are around was that it solved problems. So I don't think any of us, you know, as creatives and as storytellers, as writer, uh, you know, ever thought that, you know, fashion, when, when they'd break apart, like, what wasn't working, and it was like, oh, yeah, like, that isn't working. And, yeah, like, they are telling a story, and how do they have to solve a problem within 24 hours? And that was so exciting and sexy and addictive, frankly, that I think it really opened a lot of people's minds to, like, wow, even though I'm not in that industry, I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a fashionista, that I could really appreciate fashion in a way that I, I didn't think I could before, even though it clearly had no effect on myself. But, but anyway, so I wanted to take that opportunity that, it, and like within my own community, within the creative community that isn't fashion, um, I think there's a love of solving problems that really, really spoke to more people than just are you into fashion, which is what that show I think started out as. So. No, absolutely. I mean, it's funny that you say that because the first season, people would come up to us, guys, and say, Oh, I like your show. My wife makes me watch it. You know, my girlfriend makes me watch it. Like, they would be afraid to admit that they just liked it. But since then, you know, a lot of people are happy to say they just like it. Um, you know, it is a lot about problem solving. And that's why we did the first challenge at a grocery store, because we thought, OK, if we can make this work, we can kind of make anything work, because, you know, Everybody always thinks about Austin Scarlett's corn husk dress. Like when we saw that coming down the runway, we were flabbergasted. It was amazing how somebody with that material made something so beautiful. Um, you know, and, and certain sponsor challenges, there um, sometimes we're, we get a little worried because you know we had Saturn come on one year, and the challenge was to make the garments out of the car parts. And we were like, this is going to be a disaster. What are they going to make? And then, you know, these amazing designers, this one girl turned out this cocoon coat in like these cream, you know, uh, seatbelt covers. And it was gorgeous. It looked like, you know, a couture piece of art. So exactly, it is really about problem solving. So thank you. Thanks for noticing. Now, what we should have had today is a drawing to go on a fashion spree with Derek. And then oh. you could have won. What are you doing like and that? he would have gotten you a pair of those shoes, that's for sure. It's the first thing I noticed when he walked in. Love those shoes. Another question back there. Hi, I'm Sasha. Um, I wanted to know what you guys think reality TV has done for fashion as far as um, you say it's like a high, you know, we know fashion is like a high brow thing. So how has reality TV affected that and how, you know, what is, what is it going to become? Yep. I mean, one thing for me that I think is so interesting about fashion on television is that I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and like high fashion to me, hey. Hey. Um, wow, Cardinal fans. Exactly. So um, fashion for me growing up was like at the mall. It was like Gap and Old Navy. And then I came to New York and I went to college and I stumbled upon this whole other industry. I didn't know what a stylist was, I didn't know what an art director was, I didn't know what craft services was. Um, but 
I think if I was younger and I was growing up in St. Louis now, you have all these shows like Project Runway or, or even like Ugly Betty. Remember that? I mean, that show was a little ridiculous. It made fashion magazines look like gay spaceships. But <laughs> that at least gave a perspective into the fashion industry that I think I didn't have when I was growing up. Um, so when these shows like Project One Way, although, some of the, some, although it's not a realistic challenge for a designer to make a dress out of seatbelts, at least shows that there's sketching, that there's sewing, that there's sample making, that there's a, that there's a show involved. So I think um, it's opened up a window that I think a lot of young people have gotten really enthusiastic about. I mean, I would have loved to have seen a show like Project One Way, not that I was against not that I was not entertained by Elsa Clinch. I'd love for that show to come back. Where are you, Elsa? I know. Me too. But I think that's, too. What, that's what's interesting and different from the generation that's behind me. I mean, the applications to Parsons went up um, by some ridiculous percentage, like 43 percentage in the years since um, Project Runway has aired. And, you know, we have a lot of young people, you know, write in saying, oh, I want to be a fashion designer. It's like my dream. And um, now we have a lot of... Uh, cable executive saying, okay, we have design, we have models, you know, what's next? What else about the fashion world can we feature? Because so many people want to be part of this world, but they just don't know how. Like, if they're, if they're not technical, like a designer, or they're not tall. I got that call. I got America's it, Next Top Window Dresser. Okay, good. <laughs> it was high. born right here. <laughs> That's a good one. That's without the wine. You just gave yeah, me. Yeah, I know. I That's gave CW that next season. Give that one for free, yeah. That's it. But uh, to your point, I think you raise a very good question, though. There is still an element of highbrow fashion, right? Designers that obviously still consider their designs like they're worried about style piracy, they're worried about protecting their designs, et cetera. So that, too, is not going away. Would you agree? I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, you talk to the Carl Lagerfelds of the world, you have, because you've reported but even on Car it. What even Carl is doing more insanely mainstream things. He, like, he did, he designed some, what do they call it, like the reflective vest for the French construction. True. I mean, like, so there's definitely a, you know, a high fashion is meeting somewhere in the middle and reality TV is coming, or they're coming for you. They're coming together. Yep. Top is coming down and bottom is coming up. So it, it obviously is Sounds reaching like the mass the mass appeal, but Project Runway started it. Yes, next question. Hello, uh, touching on that, um, I've worked in the fashion industry, I've worked in beauty, I've worked now, most recently, I'm at Condé Nast in publishing, um, in marketing roles. So touching on this sort of high meets low, how do we sort of remind people that while fast fashion is great, while being able to look at something, you know, like YouTube videos and shop the look, there's so much, there's so many costs involved in, in the fashion industry. Manufacturing overseas is expensive, pattern making is expensive. Um, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of designers are, you know, breaking even. Everyone's not going to be the next Alexander Wang, you know, Behan Saraf Porg, for example. How do you sort of remind people that, you know, there's a reason why, you know, this price tag is, is associated with this, this garment? The consumer's um, think, the judge. Go ahead, Derek. Um, I think that's, I, that's a good question, and last week I was in Copenhagen for this summit on sustainable fashion, and, and what their whole thing was is that when there's, so many op when there's so many lower price point options, it's sometimes difficult to justify why a white t-shirt can cost $85 at Alexander Wang, but at Target it's $4 from Fruit of the Loom. And the issues they were asking is that if you're buying t-shirts for $4, there's something, you know, it's either mass producers there's some issue with it. Things shouldn't be that cheap. Um, the only way I think to solve some of those things is, is mass education. And in this whole summit was trying to figure out ways to do it. And they really haven't figured it out yet. Um, and it's a tricky time, I think. I think, uh, I think a lot of things are overpriced and some things are underpriced. And it's sometimes not what it should be. You know, the people that are paying what they are, it's going to the wrong person. I, I would agree, and the consumer votes, right? So they want real value, and if they get real value, they'll continue to shop your brand. If they don't, they won't. There's too many choices, um, no question. So how many Project Runway viewers do we have out in the audience? Raise your hand. All right, that's a big showing, very big showing. Can someone comment on what you like most or love most about the show? Give Jane some feedback. Who's the first to raise their hand? Anyone? Uh, 
that they're nuts? It does take a, it does take a certain sort of person. <laughs> well put. Well, they're also in a pressure cooker. I mean, people think when they come on the show sometimes, oh, when you say one day challenge, you really shoot that in a week, right? And it's actually not. They'll have 10 hours to make that. So when they find that out for real, they, some of them freak out. And then you see kind of the ramifications of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it takes a lot. Like by the, by the time you get down to the final four, like you see like they can barely keep their heads up, right. you know, like they're just exhausted. That's great TV. It yeah. takes a lot. So we wake them up. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. But it must give you great pleasure, Jane, to discover talent. I mean, that, the real purpose of the show is, has a very strong purpose. The purpose is to recognize up and coming talent. Yeah, I mean, I think going back to, I think, Sasha's question, the re people say, oh, how come American Idol, you know, the winners go on to record um, hit tracks, like th what seems the next week, and how come Project Runway Designers, it takes so long for them to come out with their lines, and then people forget about them. It is because it is so complicated. There are so many costs involved. Yeah, yeah you get $100,000, $100, hundred $150,000 if you win, but you know, to get a line together, to get backing, to get a manufacturer, to get all of that in place is more than that. Like, and just, then just the caught-ups, an office, a big fashion show in New York, mm -hmm. you know, that's 40,000, 60,000. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question, yes. Um, one question, um, myself, I'm uh, involved on the music side of, of things and production and stuff. And what's interesting to me about the whole reality fashion show is that what I find with Project Runway is a platform for creativity. And there, there are very few shows that really move forth to go inside the creative process, given that sometimes you give them, the contestants, something ridiculous that hard to do. And some of those individuals come up with something that's totally incredible and, and not expected. But it's also where creativity also meets commerce and, and entrepreneurship. And what happens is, is that the average American that sits at home that, that is so far removed from the possibilities of being involved in anything having to do with show business or fashion at all, they're impacted by something that they see. So as you were speaking about earlier, that all these future upcoming creators of, of fashion are being inspired by something that never existed before other than watching a movie that, and they like the fashion of that and if they wait to see the end of the credits they see who the person who did the fashion of a movie but I think that it's actually stimulating creativity in America and, and, and globally in a way that TV hasn't done before because you, it's one of those shows that takes you right into the process and the way that it's edited and it, it makes it a very comprehensive package in a short amount of time and, and it's very incredible and I think that it'll, it'll feed over into other art forms that we'll see that soon on television. So I applaud the, the efforts that you guys are doing and, and what's to come is exciting. Very well. Oh, the good comments. What he's saying is Project Runway has runway. Has what? Has runway. I think that we show the both the ups and downs of creativity, both the frustrations and kind of the feeling of triumph when it does work out in the end. And then the people that Derek features are kind of the ones who have gone through that process multiple times and really reached that pinnacle, which you see when you see these designers where the oftentimes at the very beginning of their careers, what the enormity of what it takes to get to the Karl Lagerfeld level or whatever, it's pretty amazing. It gives people courage that they can do it. Question? Hi, my name is Renithia. I actually work in nonprofit, so I'm speaking specifically from as a consumer, but love Project Runway. would like to know a little bit more about reinvention. So there are some spin-offs that may not have necessarily been from you guys. So we know Project Accessory, but there are other shows that exist because you guys and America's Next Top Model existed. So how do you begin to reinvent yourself such that you are able to compete with those shows um, and still be relevant for, for different brands and clients? 
Well, I mean, we have our formula, and like, I think that at the end of the day, pe what people care about are stories. So for me, uh, the most important part of the process in the beginning is casting, to find people with interesting stories, interesting ways of articulating those stories, um, not just people with the technical skills to sew and sketch. So I think that um, I, I kind of, I don't watch a lot of the other fashion reality shows that closely. Of course, you know, I'll watch an episode or two just to get the landscape, but um, for us, I think we just kind of keep our heads down and do what we do. For our 10th anniversary, like we have a lot of twists and turns planned, kind of little winks to the past for fans of the show, um, things like that. And that's what we always try to do. When we went from the 60 to 90 minute format on Lifetime, you know, that was a whole new way of thinking about the show too. Like what do we add in those 30 minutes that makes it, keeps it compelling, keeps it interesting. Um, and shows a little bit more of the judging. We added that lounge where you see the designers kind of talking to each other while the judges are talking about them, things like that. So that we're always trying to add new elements in. Yes, we have time for just a couple more. We don't want Jane to miss her flight. So it's, we have like five, 10 minutes or so. Hi, I'm Quinn and I'm working in PR. Do you struggle with um, cutting out some of the, more the creative process or the construction process in in any fashion reality show to show more of the, the drama between the contestants, the bickering in the workroom or back at the, their apartment. Do you struggle with that or? It's always a balance in every episode. It, I think it really depends on what organically happens between the cast. And also you don't really know, you know, with those 16 people what's gonna happen until you actually get them to New York and put them in the same room. Sometimes when we're casting, we think, oh, this person is going to fill that role because they behave like that with us one-on-one. -on -one. Then you put them in a, in a room with 16 people and they behave completely differently. So you just don't know what you're going to get. And sometimes, especially with team challenges, a lot of claws come out and things, you know, when people are kind of working solo, you have one thing, but then when they feel like their fate is dependent on, you know, four or five other people, that's when the real drama happens. And we do show that because that is part of the real process of what we do and you know, the process of the work world. I mean, we all know what's, what it's like to work in teams and maybe not always love every single member of the team. That happens. Very well, I know that very well. <laughs> that uh, definitely does happen. Next question. Thank you. Can yes. you talk a little bit more about uh, brand integration into the show and how you keep it believable and authentic and do you get things crammed down to you that you might not necessarily want to write into the show? So the discussions with the sponsors happens, you know, starting now, like we've already gotten pretty much way into it with our sponsors for the next two seasons. And I would say I can count on one hand the number of instances where we felt like the, the creative was kind of crammed down our throats a little bit. Usually what can happen is we'll come to a good agreement. Like, okay, you guys, they're not gonna wanna see a dress made all out of blah. So let's think about how we can make it a little bit more interesting because it's really about the process. And we tell them people get pissed if the episode is boring because the creative is not good. So it won't serve your brand in the end. So we kind of start the discussions really early, usually have a lot of back and forth, and usually come to a pretty good place by the time we begin shooting. But our sponsors have been great um, for, the, for the most part, like really, really wonderful. Uh, L'Oreal, I mean HP, we've done the Make Your Own Fabric Print Challenge. This will be our third year in a row, putting a different twist on it. And you know they're really happy with that. Yeah, I'd like to take that same very good question and pose it to Derek. When you're doing stories. Um, you're sitting with designers and you're working on a creative piece. Don't you strive for the same thing, right? Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's a very modern world, so you have to make sure everyone is very happy, especially when advertisers come into play. Um, it's interesting now, the advertisers call, I don't mean that just in editorial and just in fashion, but also in television. Those who have the money call the shots, so. That's true. Glad to hear an editor say that. Ooh. You got some money? You got some money. Okay. Got some money. Got some money. 
We can take one more question and then I think we're going to have to break, but um, you've been a great audience, let me just say that. And um, one more, anybody? No? Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate it and thanks to our panelists for, for being with us today. Um, they're great. Thank you, Stephanie. Very, very welcome, my pleasure.